Good morning. Welcome to Ag Talk and Raw, where I talk raw about agriculture and other things that are on my mind. Just hold on one second while I shut the door. William was in there, and you know, little kids just don't shut doors. Anyway, uh, yeah, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. Um, we could talk about regenerative agriculture. I'm quite excited about this coming year and, and the results that may or may not happen. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are. Um, but let's just talk about the uh, conventional way of doing things, which the conventional way of doing things actually is the regenerative way. It's just uh, we've gotten to a commercial uh, fertilizer program with commercial chemicals and you know commercial weed control, and we still have to do that this year to because I'm starting down that regenerative path. Uh, in order to make this work, you really have to have a living root in the ground at planting or just before planting. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to allow my the hay that I'm going to kill, I'm going to allow that to get up pretty tall, like boot stage or even emerging you know head or flowering stage before I go ahead and plant uh, no-till everything's gone in no-till and then I'm going to terminate it with a uh, herbicide being glyphosate and that's what I'm going to do and the reason I'm going to do it that way I was thinking about rolling it first but I don't have a 32 foot roller uh, 12 row corn planter will will do that the uh, soybean or the, the grain drill where I plant uh, no-till soybeans uh, that that'll be completely rebuilt and ready to rock and roll so we're not really going to have an issue with uh, needing to roll that hay down just take my time five six mile an hour and uh, you know plant so that the seed gets in the ground and then do the same thing terminate after the seed is in the ground and what that will do <coughs> is that will create a uh, a mat of of uh, material because the, the grain drill will lay that flat as a pancake. That will there be a sprig here and there that's that's standing up. And I was actually thinking about the uh, corn planter too. I could probably fashion a roller system to the front of that uh, to the front of that thing just for you know that that reason. Even if I just yeah just roll it directly in front of the row units, you know, so that it, it lays straight. Um, the disc openers will just kind of slice and spread that out of the way. I do have row cleaners on that corn planter, and I was told that they would probably wrap up and I would need to remove them at some point or maybe possibly have them removed. Um, but that's just the plan for me this year. I uh, will not be putting down P and K. I will be putting down my secret sauce uh, at the termination phase of the uh, of the hay fields, and I will be doing it again at about knee high uh, when I go through and spray the uh, spray Roundup on them again, and I will be using that uh, uh, what do you call it the uh, my 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 liquid sunshine. And no, it is not fish. It is not fish emulsion. Fish emulsion worked really good for soybeans, um, but this is not that. Uh, this is different. So anyway. That's that's my plan. Uh, nitrogen on the uh, corn will be probably 150 units or less. Uh, the reason I'm going to do that is because I'm going to be putting putting my compost on that hay ground at you know probably April May early May April. All April, late March, late at the end of this month and into April, probably all through April, and just spread it on there, let it do its thing. The hay will hold the uh, compost in place. The uh, the uh, yeah, the hay will hold the compost in place. The tea will soak into the ground because this ground has been hay ground for many, many, many years, and I mean a lot of years. It's been hay ground, so. Down below, there is some soil aggregation, I've, and there is some worm activity and obviously microbial activity, and I will be spiking that uh, microbial and fungal activity with my compost. It will soak into the ground, and it will 
it will definitely feed the organisms that are deep in the in the soil and regenerate rejuvenate uh, some of the microbes that aren't there it will replace them with what needs to be there and the uh, the mycorrhizal fungi will develop because that is in the compost and it will just work uh, when I do terminate and I use my my uh, my uh, yeah my microbial enhancer or microbial stimulant uh, that will cause that stuff to just just eat and grow and produce what it needs to produce for the corn and the soybeans uh, I will be like I said using about 150 units of nitrogen uh, at planting uh, when I terminate so that nitrogen will be there the plants that are terminating will not use it the corn that will be popping through the soil will be using it along with the uh, with my uh, yeah I'll probably put the fertilizer on separate uh, and terminate with I definitely have to terminate with uh, with the uh, uh oh what did he do dig on the soil oh he's digging in the dirt well, he's a little farmer mom um, so definitely going to terminate after the fertilizer. I might even put the fertilizer on a couple weeks ahead of time, uh, just for the fun of it. And uh, you know that's that'd be okay. I don't mind doing that at all. Um, as far as my microbial stimulant, the uh, hold on a second here. I need to do that and get that thing going so we can do that. And then we're back here. Uh, just the microbial stimulant is going to, it has to be put on in a timely fashion. I really don't want to put it on too early. I think I'll just use that at a termination. So I'll probably go through with my nitrogen probably after termination. So before emergence or at emergence, I, I'm not sure. The, the fertilizer that will be there from the, the compost will be more than enough to fire up the the seed that's in the ground and and get it going and it's going to have to grow up through that stuff so it's going to be a little little different than what than what I'm used to doing but we'll do it we'll get it done and uh, we'll we'll see what that corn crop does as the summer goes on the soil is going to be what they call armored um, but basically there's going to be a residue on top of the soil from the years and years of hay and that that hay that has been laid over will be food for the microbial activity which will eat that stuff and secrete the nutrients that are in the plant itself to feed the new growing crop that's how that that's how that works um, when rain comes the rain will be absorbed into the soil more efficiently uh, than if I was to go out there and plow it and roll it and allow it to just roll off that field um, I've had horrific uh, erosion in major rain events and where I have hay it doesn't seem to do that um, we get three or four inches of rain an hour and it takes a long time for that hay ground to you know to get saturated and then roll off where all the nutrients and stuff will soak into the ground whereas on ground that I've chisel plowed disked three times two three times and then roller harrowed twice and then planted that water just lays on the top and it takes a long time for it to soak in so uh, that's that's where I see the error of my ways. Um, I will be running with the disc a little bit this year where I made ruts last year um, and I will be no-tilling the majority of the corn ground that was corn last year. I'll just you know have somebody with a disc running ahead of me whether it's my wife Joseph or Tim because Joe says he's coming back so we'll see where that goes. Uh, yeah, but that's that's just what's going on with me. Uh, did receive my tote of glyphosate. Um, that was an almost seventeen thousand dollar deal uh, delivered. It got here yesterday. I'm not happy about the price of that stuff. Um, I don't believe I'm going to be using a residual. Uh, the soybeans that I planted are a dicamba bean, so. If I need to, if I have like cockleburr or something like that, I can come in with some Banville, Clarity Banville, I guess, and, and take that out. Uh, I believe Clarity will work on it without killing the soybeans. I got to talk to the fertilizer plant where I'm going to buy my chemicals from. But um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. I do have one farm that has a cockleburr problem, thanks to the former farmer of the property. Uh, and cockleburr just love to get up and go. 
um, unless I'm going to use uh, whatever other herbicide I can use on my soybeans. I may use a residual like Prowl or something like that, um, which will need to be worked in, kind of worked into the soil. So it'll have to be pre-applied before I plant sort of a thing. So I'll level out the ruts. I'll pre-apply the pre-apply my Prowl or whatever the hell I'm going to use. I'm pretty sure uh, Prowl or maybe I'll just wait and use Pursuit. Uh, on the cockleburr. I think Pursuit takes out cockleburr. I'll have to look at that label. But uh, uh, my whole goal is to get these beans in the ground and then convert that over to wheat acres where I plant soybeans. And then after wheat, come in with an intensive cover crop, multi species cover crop for corn. And uh, when that cover crop gets up and maybe matures, I'm going to drill. I'll drill rye through it, I think, or something. I'll drill something through it. Well, if there's a hairy vetch or something like that in that mix, which there probably will be hairy vetch and radishes and and possibly a winter pea or something like that, uh, I can terminate that after uh, I get it planted. So, and that will create a uh, nitrogen for my corn uh, for the following year. But that's 2023 already, you know, or 2022. Yeah, 2024. So by 2024, I should be on the uh, severely reduced nitrogen uh, program with no P and K being added, and uh, the different uh, cover crops that I'll be using will be pulling up nutrients, and the microbial activity or the universe bef beneath my feet will be working in such a manner that it will be making all the nutrients that are in the soil available to the <clears throat> to the growing plant as it as it needs. Now. I did learn something about my soil tests that I took immediately after after harvest this year, and that is that those soil tests that I did use were they were um, in a depleted state. Um, the the soil tests take the nutrients that are available to the plant at the time of the un inorganic nutrients that are available to the plant at the time of the test being taken. So if I am to say take a soil test in late April, early May, something like that, the soil test is going to come back at a very different, uh, uh, you know, their spectrum analysis. So it's going to show what's available to the plant at that time. So at the end of the growing season, before the microbes are able to break down the corn stalks and, and root mass and all this other stuff, what is available there? Um, as far as organic matter, it isn't going to be working on organic matter. Uh, the, the soil test won't show what is available through the organic matter. It'll only show what's ava available through the non-organic or synthetic fertilizer that has broken down from the microbes that are in the soil. That's why my soil test came back so disappointing uh, because they just show at the end of the season and if I was to go off of that soil test I do believe that it would cost me more money than God can create in a day uh, to, to grow a crop and it would be unnecessary. So uh, there is a couple of soil tests that I am going to take. One is a Haney test. And uh, I will take the Haney test, and that will show me what organic matter is there, what what or, uh, what microbial activity is in there. There's a uh, there's another test I can't remember the initials for it, but it's a total nutrient test, total nutrient test, and that'll show everything. Uh, the Haney test, I believe, shows the organic matter, the microbial activity, the fungus that's in the soil, what's going on there, and it'll give me a total nutrient. Uh, analysis and uh, I can go from there and adjust P and K if I need it, which I don't believe I will. I, I know I won't because I've put so much on in the last couple of years. It is there. Um, I don't believe I am lacking in the nutrients that are necessary to grow the crop. I believe I am lacking. I know that I am lacking in the biology that it takes to break down those nutrients to become available to the plant. So what I will be doing this, this year is basically feeding the biology, adding biology, feeding that biology, and allowing the soil to recover and take in that sunlight and carbon from the atmosphere to uh, feed that biology and make the unavailable nutrients that are in my soil, all soils, 
available to that plant while saving a lot of money, especially this year. I mean, we're looking at $1,000 for a blend per ton. We're looking at Christ, I don't even know what the nitrogen is going to cost to put on. Uh, the last number I got was 670 a ton for 32% liquid. Uh, AMS is what I'm going to probably use on my corn uh, because it needs to be there. Uh, I've got liquid now, but if I can get an AMS, then I will go ahead and put the dry AMS on at a 150 unit rate. Uh, because sulfur is always uh, a good thing. I do get sulfur in my, uh, in my, uh, what do you call it, in my blend, uh, or in my compost, so I don't have to worry about sulfur where I've put that uh, at all. And I'm going to try and get on all acres of corn a, at least five tons of compost to the acre. That's my goal. Whether I meet my goal or not, I don't know. If I have to go with a lower rate, that just means that I have to either put more biostimulant, biostimulant on to fire up the microbes that are actually in the soil and spur the growth of the, the mycorrhizal fungi and uh, create those aggregates, uh, not synthetically, but enhance the, the rate in which they do form and provide nutrition to the, uh, the plants. So, yeah, interesting, right? Interesting stuff. We need all the biology in the soil we can possibly get. Uh, the more biology that is in your soil, the faster your soil will recover and uh, actually warm up in the spring. Uh, I was watching a seminar on, uh, you know, later planting dates and how it's going to cost uh, farmers in planting timeliness in planting when in the reality is when you do get that biology in your soil it is only like five to ten days difference five days difference on a uh, to get that soil to a warmer state so that your seed will sprout in efficient and quick manner to get everything up and running now the 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 other benefit to planting into that green mass that's going to be on top of the of the grass of, of the soil is that the soil will not heat up it'll get to a optimum temperature like 70 degrees 65 70 degrees you really want cool soils uh, these are cool season grasses soybeans and and uh, corn are a warm season grass but they are a they need to grow in the cool soil uh, when your temperatures in your soil begin to rise above that 70, 75 degrees, that's when your biology starts to slow down. Uh, so when that biology slows down, that slows down the process of decay or that carbon to nitrogen breakdown. The fungus starts to slow down. Uh, fungus actually likes to be cool. If it's not cool and the temperature gets up to say 80, 85, you are losing, you are going to lose about half of the activity in the soil. When it gets to 90, 100 degrees, that's when you're about to a neutral uh, activity in your soil. Anything over 100 degrees, all your biology starts to die. So when you have this clear, barren earth that is exposed to the sunlight, your soil heats up, gets too hot, your biology dies, the fertilizer that you purchased for all that money stops breaking down and stops becoming available to your plants. It's just a fact uh, and it's a shame. Uh, you can use synthetic fertilizers and in, an, uh, in a regenerative program in a much reduced rate. Uh, you don't want to put too much on because it lowers the pH in that soil and then that also kills your biology. Uh, keeping a neutral pH of 6, 8, 7 is perfect for biology to grow and flourish and do its job. That's why I am hauling lime like a wild man. Uh, this week I will be hauling compost and lime all week long. I'll bring 50 load, or 55 loads of compost home, 5 times 22. I put 22 tons on there, so 5 times 20 is 100, so 2 four, 110 tons of lime a day, a week. And I need a thousand acres worth of lime, so I'm going to have to haul a lot. I've hauled a lot home. I've spread quite a bit. I've got quite a few acres, several hundred acres done now. Uh, several hundred acres are going to need to be done. 
yet, and uh, we're getting there. Uh, I had a comment from uh, the Eastern Shore Farmer. If you don't know who he is, you could check him out. He is uh, he's on the Eastern Shore of Maryland, and uh, Lewis is his name, and he he does produce some good content. Um, he should put the the uh, the political crap at the end, not at the beginning, because people that don't want to look at politics don't want to see it at the beginning of the video, they'll click right off and, and they will never come back. You put that at the end of your, of your commentary and you'll be good. But that's just, I like it because I, I, am, I try to keep up on politics on both sides of the aisle. The problem is when you're looking at the left side of the aisle, you're like, man, this does not align with anybody that I know. It doesn't align with me. I just don't like what I'm watching. So such is life. Uh, anyway, that's, that's where I'm at with that. Uh, the, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to grow 4,000 acres of row crops, 30, I think I'm at 37 or 3,800 acres of row crop, not row crops, uh, crops in general, hay, corn, soybeans. I'm hoping with the proper soil testing and application rates that I want to put on, I just got a, a GPS unit. Uh, got here day before yesterday. There will be videos on One Lonely Farmer if you want to watch those. It is the FJ Dynamics. It is actually a Chinese. Um, it is a Chinese company that produces this thing. The fact of the matter is, I just cannot afford John Deere's. Uh, I can't afford John Deere's system at twenty-seven thousand dollars for the system. A, it's not available. B, it's too damned expensive, $1,600 a year subscription. I was looking at Trimble. What I had through Trimble was a $5,000 purchase maybe 15 years ago. I think it was. I purchased that. No, it wasn't 15 years ago. Yes, it was about 15 years ago. That $5,000 purchase is now $21,000 and a $1,200 a year subscription to their system. Uh, this system was $8,000. I am trying to become a dealer for it. Um, the people that have developed this are the people that developed DJI drones. And uh, if you want more information, you just have to email me or text me. I will. I'm fighting for a dealership. I want to become a dealer. And I want to provide these things to farmers uh, everywhere. If I can provide them to farmers in Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, it doesn't matter. Farmers here in New Jersey, um, they, I've seen the system. I've watched the system work. Uh, I've met the people that are selling the system at the Kentucky um, National Farm Machinery Show. Uh, what I saw there was very easy operation, easier than anything I've ever used in the past and have been encountered through John Deere and everything else. It is an auto steer system and it is completely autonomous if you set it up to do so. Like, all you need to do is raise your planter and drop your planter. It will steer for you all the way around. Yes, amazing, right? Now, I'm going to be doing videos on that because I'm super duper excited about that. Well, let's talk about uh, fertilizer inputs for the conventional or the prescribed way of farming. Uh, prescribed way of farming that we use, the practices that we use today started in the mid to late 1940s. Uh, there was a baby boom into the 50s. There, I have uh, catalogs and I've got seed, I've got not seed, but like the Farm Bureau uh, magazines and the Furrow I think is one and Pennsylvania Farmer is another. Uh, those magazines from the 1950s, I have them. They are incredible as to where, what we were to become from where we were. And it's amazing to look back and be like, oh, got a weed problem? You can't get under control? Use Dow Alanco or Monsanto's new whatever. And I'd have to get them and, and read them. They're really cool. I uh, hope they're okay. They're in my old apartment and they've been down there for 20 years or so. But anyway. I just love them. The uh, <laughs> there's just so much in it that I can be excited for, and the biggest one is saving money, uh, not tilling anymore. Uh, I love to I love to plow. I really do. I love to chisel plow. I love to run the disc. I love the roller hair. I love to plant into barren ground. Uh, even though, if you look at Mother Nature, there is no place in Mother Nature that there is barren ground. There just isn't. 
And when there is an event, a natural event that wipes out a section of land, what grows in that section of land sprouts up from seeds that have been in the soil for 150 to 1500 years uh, to cover that ground quickly. Uh, and that's what happens to re the, because Mother Nature is an amazing thing. Uh, so <laughs> that's what happens. If it wipes what is on top that we have put there away, Mother Nature puts back what she thinks is should be there. And basically the weeds and the crap that come up is something that prepares those weeds and stuff that we don't want there is what prepares the soil for what Mother Nature wants there, whether it's trees, a different species of tree, or even if it's a grass of some sort. That's, that's what happens. Uh, and those weeds that we hate so much, the reason that those weeds are there, and I, I keep going off on this stupid regenerative ag thing uh, because I'm so excited about it, but the weeds that grow in your field is Mother Nature's response to what we have done to that soil. So let's just say cockleburr, because cockleburr sucks. Cockleburr can stay in the ground for 2,500 years, and then it can trigger to grow. Well, what does a cockleburr do? A cockleburr puts a, a taproot down super deep, and it starts pulling nutrients up from super deep. And that cockleburr has two seeds in each one of those pods, and they're non-determinate. They can sprout in the early spring. They can sprout in the fall. It doesn't matter. They don't care. They'll get this tall and put out seeds for the next two years. Um, and that whole process is pulling up nutrients from really deep in the soil to prepare for the next phase of life. Uh, microbial activity is spurred by these things. The nutrients that they produce produce or pull up from deep and make available to the next generation of plants. Uh, when those the next generation of plants sprouts, then the cockle burr will go dormant for the next event that it needs to pull those nutrients up for the next growing plant. And it goes in succession. So this cockle burr turns into, I don't know, a ragweed. It doesn't turn into a ragweed, but it, it produces enough nutrients in, in the soil to spur a response from the ragweed seed. The ragweed seed comes up along with lamb's quarter and and maybe some other other weeds and they pull different nutrients out from deep into the soil and then when they die maybe a warm season grass starts to grow like Indian grass which pulls uh, nutrients from or converts nutrients at the top of the soil like calcium makes calcium available to the next plant and then big blue comes in and switchgrass comes in and and then a legume like partridge pea or something like that starts to build this 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 ecosystem and deep in the soil all it's doing is it's pulling that carbon from the outside putting it in spurring mycorrhizal fungi and and microbes and nematodes and and bacteria and all this stuff starts to grow and become an environment that is healthy enough to support animal life, birds, insects, uh, ruminants, deer, things like that. Uh, in the United States, deer, buffalo, antelope, all that stuff could, be, and it and it will happen. It may take a lot of years to do it, um, but that's the way nature works. We as human beings think we're smarter than Mother Nature. The fact of the matter is we are just as dumb as a box of rocks when it comes to this. We are all in this whole entire world as farmers, and we don't do it on purpose. We listen to people that think they know better than Mother Nature. Therefore, it's, that information is conveyed to us. Yes, can we grow better crops using synthetics? We sure do. But what is left when we're done? What is left when we're done? A debt on one of these? No money in our bank accounts because we bought that fertilizer, we bought that fungicide, we bought that insecticide, we bought that seed treatment, we bought the everything that we needed, that we thought we needed or were told we needed to grow a crop for a growing population. When the fact of the matter is, farmers are committing suicide, going bankrupt, losing their farms and their families because they're working harder and harder to produce a crop for a group of people that don't really care about us uh, to feed a population that thinks we're all stupid. And that's an unfortunate thing. So 
when I saw this regenerative ag thing, and I, I actually heard about it in the past and thought, what do those people know? That's the old way of doing things. We're better than that. We're better than that. Well, we're not better than that. When you spray an insecticide, you kill all insects, bees, any of the pollinators. They're all gone, dead. We kill them all. So what does what do plants need to reproduce? And the reproduced plant is what we sell. We need pollinators, a massive po amount of pollinators. We need those. Birds don't eat the, the birds don't have bugs to eat. They move on. Birds do their own thing. They actually eat the bad bugs along with all the beneficial insects that we would have had because we were trying to kill something we didn't want. Fungicides. Fungicides are the fungus. Bad fungus is a sign of sick soil because there's not a good fungus there to keep the bad fungus in check. So what do we do? We buy a fungicide. Okay, we buy a fungicide. We're going to kill that badass fungus, right? We're going to kill it. So we go out and we spray fungicide. Not only do we kill the bad fungus that's causing us an ass ache, we kill what's left of the good fungus that actually feeds the microbes in the soil, and then we start to affect the microbes in the soil, and then those microbes are not breaking down the expensive fertilizer that you purchased. And the fertilizer plant's going to tell you, well, that's because your calcium levels are low. Well, if everything is working in the soil the way it's supposed to, the calcium levels don't drop. They kind of maintain themselves. There are farmers that have been doing regenerative ag for over 20, 30 years that haven't put a pound of lime on since they started. And their pHs are still where they need to be because it is a symbiotic relationship between the plant, the soil, the, the life in the soil, the life above the soil, and I'm starting to sound like I'm going to have rainbows and unicorns shoot from my ass, but it's true. When you embrace Mother Nature, you will have a better relationship with what we are doing. And the nice thing is, if I'm not out there plowing, disking, roller harrowing, and spraying all these things, I got more time to spend with my wife and son. And at this point, I get up at 2.30 in the morning, I roll with a hay, load of hay, go get a load of lime, come back. I'm exhausted. I don't even get to see my wife and son unless they come with me. And that is no life to have. So I'm going to be reducing these things that take up a lot of my time and spend more time maybe on a sailboat. Not sure. But anyhow, with that, I hope uh, this was interesting to you. If it's not interesting to you, then just click off now. It's okay. I don't mind. Uh, it's only here for people that want to change and want to put more money in their pocket with a less negative impact on the environment. And quite honestly, if you do decide to do regenerative ag, I would suggest having a sign made up, a fairly large sign. And when you have your cover crops out in the field that look like a weed patch because you've got sun hemp, you've got milo, you've got corn, you've got uh, you've got uh, hairy vetch, you've got uh, tillage radishes, you've got uh, some kind of a flowering thing that's in the ground with sunflowers and stuff like that, and people think it's a weed patch. You put a sign out there that says, Carbon Capture in Progress. Breathe easy with so-and-so farms. That's what I'm going to do. Breathe easy with, with Pandy Farm. And that's, that's what I'm going to put at the edge of every one of these fields. And people will see that and be like, hey, you know, what is he doing? Maybe I'll get some interest in it. And maybe some of the other guys that are around here will want to ask some questions and pick my brain. Because I've been picking other people's brains now for about two months. And I'm like, you know, I think this is the path that everyone should take. And then we won't have some dead old bag of shit standing down there in Washington wanting to make us all use electric vehicles that take fuel to power. It takes fuel to mine these things. It takes oil for the plastics that are in the cars. It is a lie. It is a farce. But us as farmers, we can capture the carbon that's in the air. We can use it. We can make a more nutrient-dense crop by doing these simple things that are actually one hell of a lot cheaper than putting fertilizer down. With cover crops, each cover crop that you put down will cost you between $15 and $25 per acre.
each cover crop. So if you put rye down, you're looking at $20, $25 an acre, $15 to $25 an acre, depending on your source of rye. And that is for soybeans. When you put wheat in, that is a cover crop. You are going to be putting a lot more in. It is a cover crop, but it is a cereal crop that you can harvest. After that wheat, that's when you put in your multi-mix, multi-species mix in the soil, on the ground, to capture all that carbon, to regenerate the soil, to keep the microbes and the fungus alive, to make them do the job that the fertilizer plant is doing, and they're all going to do it for free. Nitrogen is like a very large part of the air that we breathe. Why not harvest the nitrogen that is in the air that we breathe and put it into the soil to grow a crop instead of just saying, hey, you know what, I got to buy a tractor to pull a sprayer to pull, uh, you know, to, to, to pump in a product that they pulled out of the air synthetically to spray on a crop that lowers my pH, that makes me have to buy lime, that kills off microbial activity and fungus and all these other things that it's doing negative to me. Why don't I just use a legume and harvest that nitrogen, put it in the soil, and as the fungus and the microbes and the bacteria and all this stuff feed on those nodules from the legumes to feed the corn through the season to produce a very good crop. It doesn't have to be 300 bushels to the acre. It really doesn't. Why should I go bankrupt to feed the world when I can farm and grow a crop with a much larger profit margin to feed my family? And if, if, if we all got to that, to that point where we're, instead of going for that high number of bushels, that high yield, for a profit margin that is so paper thin that if you have a hiccup in the weather, you, your profit margin goes away and you're losing money. I watched a video yesterday where they say the average income of farmers in 2021 was negative $1,600. Negative $1,600, so they all run down to the Farm Service Agency and they get that CD, that, that DCP payment and all those other payments that they're getting they are essentially on welfare to grow a crop that is not necessary to grow that high of a crop. But when people start realizing that yield does not equal profit, profit is in the practice. If you are not profiting from the practices you are doing, you need to do something different to profit from your practices. You ever notice when you go to the... Uh, fertilizer plant, and I'm not knocking these guys, but as a farmer, you go to the fertilizer plant and you see that row of new pickup trucks. There's like four of them, four new pickup trucks. Like every other year, there's a new pickup truck in those spots. Those are your managers, your purchasing agents, all these people that are in that fertilizer, the, the upper crust of the fertilizer plant. They got new pickup trucks, they got nice houses, they're taking fancy vacations and they have the weekends off and they're smiling all the way to the bank. Whereas the farmer, we're working seven days a week, sometimes 16, 18, 20 hours a day in the summer to be able to pay that bill that you have created to get that highest yield in the hopes that there's not a disastrous weather event so that you have the highest yield to make that thin profit margin. But if we can farm Mother Nature, make Mother Nature work for us, and we can produce a reduced yield, maybe it's only going to be 30 bushels less than that 300 bushel yield. You know, you might be able to get that 270. I don't know. I don't know. But I shoot for 200 bushels, and I would be happy with 170. I'd be happy with 150 if it didn't cost me $600 an acre to grow that crop. Because $600 an acre, if it costs me, say, $75 an acre to grow the crop versus that $600, um, I've got, you know, $525 more in my pocket per acre that I can pay rent on and secure my, my standing on that land. And I can maybe take my wife on a real nice, fancy vacation. I usually do. I have. COVID screwed that up, but when you take that vacation to the far off land, in her, in her case, she, she's from the Philippines, we go to the Philippines, it's where we go. I love the Philippines, it's a fortunate thing that I love going there. Uh, it's a cheap place to go because if, it, if she was from, say, Australia, 
uh, or England or Belgium or France or Germany or something like that, the plane tickets alone just to get there and back would cost more than an entire three-week vacation in the Philippines. And that's a fact. So why not be able to go to France, Australia, Germany, Belgium, Austria, wherever, England? It's, you know, they're beautiful countries to visit. But as a farmer with those profit margins, because our practices are so, I'm not going to say they're wrong, but they're so bastardized to pro to make everybody else profit from what we do. And we get thrown pennies or even worse, an average income of negative $1,600. That's sad. That's sad. And I mean, we're buying tractors, we're buying plows, we're buying discs, we're buying high-speed till, high tillage machines, whether they're vertical tillage or high-speed discs. We're buying the latest and greatest corn planters, soybean planters, or whatever planters we have because, you know, that's that's the way it is. And I love to see a, a John Deere no-till drill air seeder that's like 45 feet wide going through a pristine plowed field. Well, what's the point in buying that machine when you can do it with an old double 8300 John Deere uh, grain drill you know they're not using these things to plant in a no-till situation and they're no-till planters they are designed to do the no-till program if you do the no-till program with cover crops and uh, you know carbon capture you will be much happier you'll be able to pay for those things a lot easier because your profit margins won't won't be here they'll be here and instead of putting pennies in your bank account you'll be putting dollars in your bank account um, and it's not a perfect system. You have to you have to do this within, you know, as Gabe Brown says, within context, which makes perfect sense. I listen to Gabe Brown, and he's kind of this is how it's done within your context. When you listen to him for the first time, and he says this is how it's done, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, and then he follows it up with context. When Gabe Brown says you have to do this, 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 and this. It's like, oh, you're going to tell me what to do? Well, I don't think so, pal. But then when he says within context, meaning your surroundings, your land, your farm, your area, your, your uh, growing season within that time frame, I think I fit in the regenerative ag program much better than Gabe Brown. I really do. I have a longer growing season. I have a more diverse um I don't have better soil type. My soil type is clay with rock. Um, but it doesn't mean that those nutrients aren't hidden down in those rocks. And it definitely doesn't mean that those, those roots can't tunnel into those rocks and pull that nutrients out. Because they can. They absolutely can. And, uh, yeah, so that's... Let's see what the hell is he saying. I'm going to end this because Joe is going to call me. Sure. So anyways, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. If not, I'm sorry, but things have to change or we're all going to be bankrupt. All of us. We're headed for tough times.